What's up, everyone? Welcome into Dodger Heads, presented by DodgerBlue.com. My name is Jeff Spiegel, joined today by Sebastian Ibarra, here to talk a little bit about a Dodgers player that I don't want to say came out of nowhere because he was a former top prospect, Sebastian, but Gavin Stone has been a revelation this year, living up to the hype that many people had a year ago, and maybe even more so. Last night, dominates the Mets in game two of that doubleheader. Seven innings, three hits, no earned, seven strikeouts. I want to talk bigger picture as well. But first, I'll start with last night. What did you see from Gavin Stone last night, Sebastian, if anything, that maybe you haven't seen before? Yeah, it's the most dominant we've seen him this season. Seven Ks was a season high, only the three hits allowed. It's kind of similar to his start against the Blue Jays, but he had like that home run given up. So this he was like in complete control from start to finish in this outing. Uh, what you saw a lot was a lot of increased sinker usage, which we've been talking about on the website a little bit. Yeah. Um, he's making that change up more impactful by like using it less, bringing it out when he really needs to maybe a swing and miss or a strikeout, stuff like that, or a, just a strike in general to get back into the count. Um, so kind of the way he's been pitching with that sinker is getting the soft contact, getting ground balls and stuff like that. And that kind of is like the Logan Webb model. So the Dodgers kind of have their own Logan Webb in that way where that's his calling card. He doesn't get a lot of strikeouts, but he gets a lot of ground balls, soft contact, stuff like that. Yeah, you mentioned Webb, and I hadn't thought of that comp. Obviously, the pitch mix, um, there's some similarities there. But that's like – that's the if you draw out the what's the best case scenario for a guy like Gavin Stone. I mean, Logan Webb is one of the better pitchers in Major League Baseball. And to your point, maybe he doesn't fit on some of the traditional metrics. And yet, if Gavin Stone can develop into that, I was looking at his numbers. Stone last season, he made four starts and totaled across four starts, 15 and a third innings. He allowed in those starts four, five, seven, and seven earned runs. And in 15 and a third, he allowed 32 hits, eight walks and had just seven strikeouts. Fast forward to 2024. Since April 26th, six starts. All six have gone six or more innings. He has allowed one earned run or fewer in five of the six. The total is a .85 walks and hits per inning pitch and a 1.85 ERA. And I say all this because, Sebastian, I think the Dodgers are on the verge in the next week and a half or two weeks of having to make an interesting decision. And I think there's three kind of pathways they can go. And what I'm talking about is Bobby Miller is going to be due back soon. He made his first rehab start on Sunday down in Rancho Cucamonga. Um, he had done a simulated game before. So let's say cautiously that maybe he's got two more starts that the Dodgers want to see him make at the minor league level to get himself built back up. When he comes back, assuming Glass now stays healthy, Yamamoto stays healthy, Bueller stays healthy, and then Bobby Miller inserts himself back into the rotation, the Dodgers have three choices. Option one is make Gavin Stone the number five starter and get rid of James Paxton. Option number two is get rid of Gavin Stone, send him back to the minors and leave James Paxton there. Or option three is do what they've claimed they aren't doing all along and go to a six-man <laughs> rotation. So how do you see the Dodgers playing up? Because I don't I don't think they I don't think they expected Gavin Stone to be this good to the point where Maybe fourth option is Bobby Miller isn't the guy who comes back because some think that, that Stone has been better than Miller even. Yeah, I don't think the – as much as I want it, that's probably – six mode rotation is probably like what I want the most and what makes the most sense. But they seem kind of reluctant to do that. Mostly yeah. I'd say that because of uh, – they had Landon Knack and they, he could have been in this role for a while, yeah. but they sent him back down. Um, but the Stone versus Paxton, I'd got – obviously you got to – kind of give to stone the the argument here is going to be for the or the dodgers what they're going to be looking at is higher floor versus higher ceiling slash like trust the veteran or do you trust the young guy to keep it going do you yeah. trust that this is just kind of you know a flash in the pan or is this sustainable so that's kind of gonna that's going to be the deciding factor i think i'd give it to stone just kind of looking at both of their seasons their as season sample sizes Paxton, 3.49 ERA, but he has a 403 in his last seven starts, 49 innings, uh, 5.14 K per nine, which is the lowest of his career, yeah, and 5.14 walks per nine. So his walk, K per nine and walk, walks per nine are the exact same, it's which great. isn't great. Yeah, <laughs> 5.56 FIP, and then hit was it 
what has really allowed him to be successful uh, has been the 84.7% men left on base. He's leaving them on base that percentage of the time. Um, and kind of also a little bit of the most important stat is the 5-0 and record. They are winning when he's on the mound, which is, you know, it's pretty important. But yeah. Stone, 3.16 ERA, 2.13 in his last seven starts, 57 innings. So you're getting a lot more length when you're throwing yeah. Stone out there. 6.47 K per nine, which, you know, isn't a lot more – a lot more than Paxton, but it's the way that Stone is pitching, how we've been talking about soft contact, stuff like that. 3.4, uh, 3.50 FIP. Um, and then Stone, Stone's calling card, like we've been saying, is the 90%, 90th percentile exit velo, 88th percentile hard hit percentage. So yeah. that's what's allowing Stone to have more success than Paxton lately and just kind of him, Stone getting established more. So I'd give it, for those reasons, I'd probably give it to Stone over Paxton and then if they don't elect to go to the six man rotation. Yeah. I, I think the knack one is a great point. Like if they wanted to go six man, they could, they had a guy who was at the major league level, who's performing well in land and knack. Um, it, this one's so interesting. Cause there's two pieces, right? Like let's just throw all contract stuff away, all optionality away and just look at stone and Paxson. There's not an argument to be made for James Paxson when you're comparing these two. Um, I, I know what the ERA says it is, but if you're looking at kind of a sustainability perspective, um, you want to talk about expected ERA and, and going to the StatCast page. James Paxton literally does not have a single pitching category in which he is above average, except for his extension, which is not actually a performance-based metric. Okay, His expected ERA is 10th percentile. His expected uh, batting average is 22nd percentile. Uh, his chase rate is 17th percentile. His whiff rate is 10th percentile. His strikeout rate is 6th percentile. His walk rate is 9th percentile. He's in the 30s and 40s for exit velocity and barrel rate, all of that kind of a thing. And so while the numbers may seem similar from a box score perspective, Matt Moreno is going to love that you mentioned his win-loss record. Um, but when you look at Gavin Stone, on the other hand, it's it's the exact opposite. The expected ERA, he's about league average. But other than that, quality of contact, 90th percentile exit velocity, 88th percentile hard hit rate, he is one of the best in baseball at limiting hard contact. And I think that's what gives the edge here to Gavin Stone. And, and you've seen it. The second piece, I think you mentioned, and, and this cannot be overstated, Gavin Stone is giving them length. Like yesterday, it's the perfect example. They had a doubleheader. If you go through the Dodgers bullpen and I ask you how many of those guys you feel good about, there's probably four names that you feel good about, one name that you feel okay about. That's Michael Grove, to give context. And then a bunch of guys who, if they got option tomorrow, you'd forget they ever played for the Dodgers. The fact that they played a doubleheader and Gavin Stone in game two, after game one goes extra innings, was able to give them seven innings was remarkable. And again, he has gone six or more innings in six consecutive starts. He is resting the bullpen. He is giving them length. I think that is the cherry on top to all of it. Now, despite everything I just said, Gavin Stone can be sent down to the minor leagues and James Paxton can't. And so, like, practically, what do I think they're going to do? If they have to choose, if they feel like they have to choose between one of these guys or one of these three guys, if you want to include Miller... Sadly, I think it's Gavin Stone that would be the odd man out. I'm like you. I wish they would go to a six-man rotation. If it were up to me and contracts didn't matter, I would get rid of Paxton. Heck, my my advice would be trade. Somebody would trade you something for Paxton right now because the ERA is good. Everybody needs pitching. He's a veteran guy. You could probably get something similar to what the Dodgers had to give up to get Lance Lynn last year, um, knowing that Bobby Miller is coming back, knowing that you have Landon Knack there, and then sort of depending on how you feel about Clayton Kershaw, Dustin May. So. That's a long-winded way of saying Gavin Stone is clearly a better pitcher than James Paxton. We debated on our show last night. You can make the case Gavin Stone is a better pitcher than Bobby Miller. But the question is, once you get to real life and the practicality of contracts and options and all of that, I think that's where it makes it interesting. So let me end with this question. I threw it up on social media last night. We talked about it on our live show. It got a lot of engagement. The tweet was, if everyone is healthy, Sebastian, if everyone's healthy, that's coming back. So I'm not talking about like Otani, Emmett Sheehan. I'm talking about like, Clayton Kershaw, Dustin May, Bobby Miller. All those guys are healthy. Glass now is healthy. Yamamoto is healthy. Bueller is healthy. Stone is healthy. Knack is healthy. If everybody is healthy, Gavin Stone is the number blank pitcher in the Dodgers rotation. Where do you have him? Yeah, I have him. Um, I know three is the popular one. I still have him fourth behind Miller just because. Yeah. And I'd understand. I'd completely understand. the. I'm, I could flip him either or. but yeah. And I completely understand an argument for Stone being three. But I just think. Miller's pure stuff just and plus we've only seen three starts of him of yeah. Miller 
and you look three starts in, into Stone's year this season. It took him yeah. a while to get where he is now, just kind of develop and kind point. of establish himself. Um, so obviously we haven't seen a lot from Miller, but I think just his pure stuff, that fastball, and he has he hit, he has a really good change of his own. He has a lot of movement on his changeup. He has a lot of good, you know, offerings. So I just think that fastball and the the mix of his off speed and stuff like that. Yeah, I'd be willing to have have faith, not have more faith in him, or like I don't know how to put this, but like I still have faith in him to be like a number three type pitcher right now, and then probably front line in the future. So. Yeah, Miller three, Stone four, but I, either or I could go for either or. Those. It's it's exactly how I feel. I think in that three to six range, I think you could make a case for Miller, for Stone, for Bueller, even Kershaw. If you want to have an optimistic view and just say, look, whenever this guy's been pitching, it's like a sub two and a half ERA, no matter what. I think Stone and Miller have the most compelling case over Bueller and Kershaw because of where those guys are at in their career. And I think Miller and Stone is interesting because it's a floor versus ceiling conversation the, the ceiling on bobby miller is unquestionably higher than the ceiling on gavin stone but i also think like bobby miller if we're realistic and just looking at what he's actually done performance wise it's been okay like it's it's like a high threes era i believe is that is for his career and so um i think it you're projecting still a little bit with bobby miller whereas with maybe with gavin stone over the last six starts you kind of think like i know what i'm getting and it may not be you know a 12 strikeout per nine kind of a guy who's going to just like miss bats and have a 30% whiff rate, but it's going to be a guy who gives me length. It's going to be a guy who limits hard contact. And I think there's value in that. And so um, I, I think I would lean stone over Miller right now for this season for right now, if I had to make a choice, but um, I think it's a fun conversation to have. And I'd love to hear from people. Where do you have him it, it, in the context of, I think Yamamoto and uh, glass now to me are clear one and two. I had some people saying they have stone above Yamamoto. So that's a take that I suppose you could have. I've, some people that say Stone is like seventh tied with Tony Gonsolin in a in a ranking. So we've got the wide range, but I'd love to hear from people below where you have him. Um, and uh, yeah, it, it's a fun conversation and that's what we're here for, right? It's just being able to sit around and debate things that many people might say are dumb and where Gavin Stone ranks if everyone is healthy, which is an insane hypothetical, I think is a good one. So uh, we appreciate everybody for joining us here on Dodger Heads presented by DodgerBlue.com. Again, that is Sebastian. I am Jeff. Enjoy the rest of your day. Day game for the Dodgers today, 1 10 p.m. against the Mets, going for the sweep before they head home to play the Colorado Rockies. So enjoy your day. As always, go Dodgers. <laughs>